Okay, we're going to go through the uh, whole chapter. And uh, we, we're not going to touch on everything, but we're just going to touch on some, a couple general things that we can get out of uh, Matthew chapter 10. So Matthew chapter 10 from verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now right away what strikes me there is that's kind of a little odd because you have God incarnate, means God in flesh, God stepping out of heaven to become like one of us. God is perfect, right? God is perfect. God doesn't need my help. God doesn't need your help. Jesus didn't need anybody. But look at God's plan. God's plan to bless this world and to reach a fallen people is to use people like you and I. In other words, how are people in, at your school going to know about Jesus? Who is he sending? You. People at work, who are they going to hear about Jesus from? Hopefully they turn on the television and Billy Graham's got a rerun on. Well, God is sending you. No such thing as a God-forsaken work environment as long as a Christian is there. How about your neighbors? How about your family member, unsafe family members, your friends? Uh, Jesus doesn't need us, but God's plan is to use people like you and I. It brings God glory. It's the way he expresses his love by using broken people to love other broken people. The perfect one using the imperfect to bring about something that's perfectly wonderful. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter. He's kind of famous. And Andrew, brother Andrew, a little less famous. James, son of Zebedee. Uh, not James, the brother of Jesus, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, the guy who wrote this book we're reading, James, the son of Elpheus, who may also have been Matthew's brother, because Matthew is called son of Elpheus at one point, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, or maybe some people are saying a better translation is just Simon the Zealous, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Uh, these are the original first 12 apostles. Do not go up among the Gentiles or into any town of the Samaritans. Go out rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, you probably have a question right now, why didn't Jesus want to go to the Gentiles? Well, he had to fulfill his mission to the Jews first, but we're going to see right at the end, before Jesus returns to heaven, he gives them this commission to then go out into all the world. So first, reach uh, the Jewish people in the, in the area of Israel, and then go out from there. Establish a beachhead first. Uh, as you go, proclaim the message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, no bags for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for workers are worthy of their keep. Whatever town or village you enter, such uh, search for the one worthy person there and stay at the person's house until you leave. Uh, as you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. In other words, if you share your faith and people don't receive it, Jesus is saying, just shake it off. Just shake it off. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to you, your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. So when people reject Jesus Christ, that's a very, very serious thing. People, if you want to have Christianity without fire and brimstone, you, you can't have your Bible and you can't have Jesus. Jesus' warning very serious consequences if we turn our backs on him. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Oh, well, thank you, Jesus. Uh, what happened to the prosperity gospel there? I'm sending you out so you can all drive a Mercedes Benz and bigger house, bigger car, bigger wife. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm a slave to my circumstances and upbringing. My uncle's a pastor. He always said that line, and I've never been able to escape from it since. 
I've been preaching decades, and I still use that line that my uncle cursed me with. In other words, I'm not responsible. It's, <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> but Jesus, here, he's not sugarcoating it. He, we sell Christianity today by saying, oh, everything will be pink and baby blue and comfortable, and you'll have the white picket fence and precious moments, and we make it sound so easy. And in the, in the Bible, they never talk about Christianity in that way. And Jesus said, I'm sending you out, but you're going to be like sheep among wolves. It's, it's going to be rough out there. Therefore, be, be wise, be as shrewd as snakes, but be innocent as doves. We don't have to be out there cynical. We don't have to be out there trying to manipulate people into believing Jesus. Just be face value what we are. Be innocent. Bring the gospel. Be straightforward. Uh, be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils, and you will be flogged in the synagogues. We think that persecution happened in the past because we live in the United States. More Christians suffer, die, and are imprisoned for their faith today than at any other time in history. And next time we're cl crying out to God because our plumbing's broke or the car won't start. And I'm not saying we can't pray about those things. We can. But think about your brothers and sisters. And the Lord didn't abandon them even as they're going through this hardship. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, don't worry about it. Because I'm going to set you... No, that's not what he says. Don't worry about it because as you're in jail, I'm going to give you the words to say. And we saw last, last uh, Monday night, dear brother, in prison, God did release him. But he let him sit there for a while because God was, according to our brother, God was more interested in his glory than our brother's comfort. And while he was in prison... Uh, it was a prison in, in, in India, not a, not a prison like you'd see in a big city in India or, or in the West, but they had the men in one place and the women in the other place, and the women would go to jail. They'd even bring their own children with them uh, because there's no place for the kids to go. And while he was in jail, he witnessed to all these inmates and to prison guards, and he, he taught one little girl who was staying in jail with her mom how to share the gospel, and she was sharing her gospel. And so sometimes God has bigger plans than just you and I being comfortable. Which, honestly, if you're not a Christian, one of your biggest goals in life is to be safe and be comfortable. And if you are a Christian, that's often my, our biggest goal, too. Just want to be safe, just want to be comfortable. And God says, yeah, I've got different plans. I've got different plans for you. So verse 16 again, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils, and you will be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, not if, when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you. What an amazing, what an amazing supernatural promise from the living God. Here's the hardship that's going to be in store for the church, for the Christians. Uh, brother will betray brother to death. A non-Christian brother may turn in his Christian brother and say, there's a church over here, you don't know about it, you probably should. Uh, a father... A non-believing father will turn in his Christian child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Here's the case where the children don't believe in Jesus. The parents do. The child sees and he tells his teacher, tells a government official, and the parents get hauled off. Everyone will hate you because of me. Oh, Jesus, you're not really good at how to win friends and influence people. Let's put that on our sign outside, right? Come to Foundation Church. Everyone will hate you because of Jesus. Uh, no, seriously, but Jesus is good, and so Jesus is honest. And the world really, really does look down its nose at Christianity. I mean, even in a country where, where we're free to worship, 
and we have these freedoms, you can get ostracized. Uh, maybe you won't lose your friends, but they may laugh at you. They may think you're an idiot. Uh, I've got a lot of friends who they're still my friends, but they think Dan just doesn't got a lot of horsepower upstairs. If he did, he wouldn't be believing this stuff. They look down at me, and I just love them anyways because what else are you going to do, you know? Uh, no, I'm actually, you know, what are you going to do? So, but, but in some places, it's much worse than that, right? Today, Christians are in jail because of Jesus. Christians are killed every day, every single day around the globe because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Everyone will hate you because of me, again, verse 22. But those who stand firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, it's okay to flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Uh, students are not above their teacher, nor servants above their master. Talking about discipleship here, and Jesus talking about his disciples. It is enough for students to be like their teacher and servants to be like their master. If the head of the house has been called the devil, how much more the members of his household. Jesus Christ was called Satan. He was punished. He was beaten. He was executed. Now, if Jesus is saying, if this is going to happen to me, what do you think is going to happen to you guys? So, don't be afraid of them. Well, I just thought you said all these. But anyways, don't be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, nothing that's hidden that will not be made known. For what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. Brothers and sisters, are we proclaiming our faith from the rooftops? Or email, or Facebook, or Twitter, or whatever the case may be? Uh, just, this is really cool. This is, and as an aside, we went to Delavan this week, and we were in McDonald's, and a gal walked up to me and said, by the way, if you're watching, I watch you on television. Thank you. Uh, and then, uh, then the next day on Saturday, ran into a fella uh, at a meeting for all the international students. And he said, you're that pastor of that church. And I said, how do you know I'm a pastor? He says, because I see you on TV. So we are proclaiming it. As a church, we're proclaiming it on the rooftops. I guess the antennas are, no, the, the cables, the charter cables are catching it. Uh, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. So Jesus is not backing off of this. The safest place in the world you can be is right in the center of God's will. You, you might be killed, but there's nothing that can hurt you. Nothing. Your soul is secure. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but they can't touch your soul. Rather, fear the one in heaven who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two so sparrows sold for a penny? Sparrows are cheap. They're everywhere. Yet, not one sparrow falls to the ground, and God doesn't know about it. And, every, and, ev and even the hairs on the top of your head are numbered. God knows uh, how many hairs on the top of your head. God knows how many atoms make up the water in this little bottle, even as it's evaporating. I mean, God, God knows everything, every little quark, every little neuron. God knows everything firing off in our brains. Every, every leaf that rustles in the, tr in the trees, God knows it and the sound it's making and which direction it's facing. God knows it all. God's aware of it all. And when these sparrows fall to the ground, and sparrows do fall to the ground, God knows it. Every hair on the top of our heads are numbered. Now we say before and after we shampoo. So don't be afraid. Brothers and sisters, you're worth more than two sparrows. And uh, Jesus is going to tell us exactly how much he thinks we're worth when God himself will suffer and bleed for you. So when you're feeling worthless, remember God thinks you are worth the blood of God. When you're feeling worthless, remember what Jesus was willing to go through for you. Jesus endured this for you so that you could have eternal life and be with him forever. Whoever publicly acknowledges me, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever publicly disowns me, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on earth. 
Jesus is not letting up, does he? And, and you wonder where we get this kind of precious moments Christianity from, because it's not from Scripture. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have turned, come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be members of your own household. And then we say, oh, but... And I even heard a person recently say, no religion is worth trouble in a family. And I thought, well, how about not religion? How about there's a God who sees us just as we are, so messed up. He says, I'll take you as you are. I'll love you and I'll forgive you. And I'll give you eternal life. And then go love your mom and your dad, your brothers and your sisters, and bring them to me so they can have it too. But be warned, they may reject you for it. Is there a love? Is there anything worth that? If you have nothing worth dying for, I want to ask you if you have anything really worth living for. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And taking up a cross is not a pleasant thing. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes someone known to be a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes someone known to be righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives a, even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, there must have been some thirsty kids around there. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is known to be my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will be rewarded. And I remember uh, I knew the son of a man who at one time this man was the highest ranking uh, African-American uh, military officer in, in the United States Army. And he left the Army, even though he was on the fast track uh, to, uh, to success in the military, he left the military to become a pastor. And I got to meet the pastor as well and speak with him. And he, he gave a message once where he was out on maneuvers and was separated with uh, a white fella. And the white fella, they were hungry, they were thirsty, and shared his canteen with them. And I can always remember the way he shared this passage. Whoever shares just a cup of cold water. God sees that kind of heart. And God blesses. Let's be people that are blessing other people in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's be loving people because it beats the alternative. Mean, spiteful, bitter, hard-headed people. Let's, let's be loving. Let's bring the love of God. And God says, I see it all. I see everything. And when you love in my name, you will be rewarded. Let's go back to uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him. And then look at verse 2. These are the names of the 12 apostles. A disciple is somebody who learns from a master. His way of life, the master's values. More than just being a simple student, like you sit in math class, but you're not necessarily a disciple. Uh, you, you, but more than just a student, a disciple is somebody who's watching his master in, in trying to emulate his master and in, in follow after his way of life. What are his values? What's a priority to the master? What's a priority to the discipler? Uh, the word apostolos or apostle is similar to the word herald. A herald is like somebody who goes before a king or a messenger, a person that a king sends out on a mission to represent him. So we have the, uh, the disciples, and from the disciples come the apostles. We see this concept throughout the New Testament, this idea that we come to Jesus as disciples, we learn to obey him, we learn to follow him, and then he sends us out. And what do he send them, these people out to do? To bless people and to call them to repentance because the kingdom of heaven is near. Brothers and sisters... As we learn to obey the Bible, as we learn to obey the heart of Jesus Christ, and we're submitting ourselves, you know what God's going to do? He's going to now take us and kick us out, not of his family. He's going to kick us out of just a nice holy huddle so that we can go out and be meeting people and sharing Jesus Christ with others, letting them know, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance wasn't a popular message then. It's not going to be real popular now. But if people are going to understand what the cross means, they've got to know 
that they're sinners and that they need to repent. And so we learn, we're disciples, and as we're learning, then Jesus Christ is sending us out to go ahead and grab more people and just bring them in, bring them in, and, and grow the family. Uh, so we see this throughout the New Testament. Jesus teaches, uh, well, he's got a group of 70, and then a group of 12, then a group of three. Uh, Jesus teaches disciples in, the, in order that the disciples can, what, teach others. Yeah, this is a principle. God doesn't need others. But God is laying down this principle. And ever since Jesus, that's what the church is about. We raise up disciples who then go out and teach others, who can then teach others, and in turn can reach even more and more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul tells his disciples, uh, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul tells the young pastor Timothy, he said, follow this principle when he wrote, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Thank you. I, there's got to be more than one person paying attention this morning. So God teaches us so that we can teach others. Thank you. Thank you. And then in Titus uh, chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible commands that older women must, older women must train younger women how to love their husbands and children. Older women. This is women in the faith, Christian women, f women who are trying to follow after God. For that to happen, it's, it takes two things. Women who have strong marriages and who have already raised children to grow up and follow the Lord, they need to be willing to share their experiences, their wisdom with the younger gals. And the second thing that needs to happen is the younger girls have to be able to be humble and to listen and to learn from the people who have gone on before them. And this is a pattern God establishes. People learn how to follow and obey, and they have life experiences learning what grace means and how it all works together, and then they share with others. And then these people are supposed to go share with others. others. Yeah, one to the other, to the other, to the other. So in Christianity, to be someone sent to represent Christ to our culture, we first, well, and it doesn't, you don't always, it's not this, then that. Sometimes the two go together, but we need to be good disciples, right? We need to be learning to be obedient to this, otherwise our witness doesn't count for much. We need to recognize someone or some people that we can learn from, their example. Spend time with them. Try to seek, seek out this person. Spend time with them. And we need to intentionally apply what we learn to our own walk. Don't just sit there. And it's not osmosis, you know. We have to be saying, oh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to apply it and I'm going to use it in my life. We usually don't use the word apostle today, at least I don't, because we don't want to confuse people or claim like we're just like the first 12 apostles. But this principle of one person learns and sharing it to the next who in turn shares and shares it, this principle uh, remains the same. And we can see it right in the Great Commission of Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 28. Remember the Great Commission, 18 through 20? Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go. Again, he's not kick me out of the family. Jesus is telling you to go talk to people that don't know Jesus yet. Maybe you have some friends. They don't know Jesus. Do you have anybody in your family that hasn't come to Jesus yet? Co-workers? Jesus says, I want you to go. I want you to go out and make disciples of all nations. And remember, we learned that that's eth ethnos, ethnic groups, all people groups. So it's not just like, like China or India has so many thousands and thousands of different people groups. It's every people group within those places as well. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So we take it from God. We're learning to be obedient, to humble ourselves to it. And then we, go, we turn around and we teach others to also be obedient to the things of Christ. And Jesus says, surely I'm going to be with you right to the very end of time, right to the very end of this age. So quickly, uh, I want to focus just a little bit, a history, kind of a history lesson of the, of the 12 apostles. We know some things about them more than others. Like Peter, we know a lot about Peter than some of the others, not so much. But I want to go through these guys because here's the, here's the thing. In Jewish culture, they had great, a great education system for that time in the world because they, 
believed in reading the, what we call the Old Testament. So students would have to read, they'd have to memorize, and guess what? The smart students went on to further training, religious education, became religious leaders. Jesus didn't choose any of those. Jesus did not choose these guys who are going to impact the world so that 2,000 years later, the world is shaking because of what started. Jesus didn't choose the elite. And some of you are thinking, oh, good. And some of you are thinking, well, that counts me out. Uh, that's between you and God, my friends. God did not choose the upper elite, the super altogether guys to start this movement. He chose just 12 average, regular Joes, just chose regular guys. Uh, we can recognize with them, within them examples that we can follow ourselves. Okay, let's start with Simon uh, Peter. Simon Peter was a fisherman. Got some guys in our church who liked to go fishing. That was his job. And he was a rough and ready kind of guy. He spoke his mind. Sometimes he was violent. Remember, he cut off the, the, the servant of the high priest's ear. He cut off the guy's ear with a sword. That's, I mean, he had issues, we would say, in modern time, right? Uh, but he's changed because of his time spent with Jesus. See, you spend time with Jesus, you do change. You're not the person that you were before. A lot of people believe that uh, Peter dictated the gospel of Mark, because a lot of, sometimes people said, well, why doesn't Peter have a gospel? But uh, according to Papias, who is a very, very early Christian pastor, he said that Mark wrote it down after being, it was dictated to him by, by Peter. So that could mean, uh, well, anyways, Peter wanted to, uh, that could mean that, see, we talked about this before. Some people who don't believe in the Bible say that why would Matthew, a real apostle, just copy from Mark because Mark wasn't one of the 12. And then we said it's also possible that Ma the book of Matthew came first, and then Mark is just a, a reduced, slimline version of it, uh, to be given to Gentiles, cut out some of the Jewish nature of it, just to go quickly through everything. But it's also possible that Matthew just took it because he knew Peter dictated it. So he said, okay, that's good. I'm going to take that and then I'm going to put the framework around it to tell more of the story. So don't, when, you see, uh, when you see the History Channel or something and people are saying, why would Matthew, an apostle, copy from, just tell them, oh my goodness. Uh, there's a lot of different ways how that could have happened. And, okay, moving on. That was an aside. A useful, a useful aside. Peter was very, very influential in the very first church in Christianity, right in Jerusalem, and then in the church in the city of Antioch, and probably, uh, history tells us, in Rome as well. Unlike the later Apostle Paul, Peter was a married man. So he's coming at all of this Christian faith thing from a different perspective. At one point, Jesus calls him a man of little faith. Now, it's bad enough when somebody at church thinks, man, you don't have much faith. But when Jesus says, you, you know, you're a man of little faith, that's kind of a blow in the gut. Who would have imagined that Peter would be this giant of Christianity? Well, you know who imagined it? Jesus saw the potential in him. Jesus knew where he was going to go. But he started off as a violent man who, who was running off all the time, not thinking clearly, and didn't have enough faith. Jesus even said, you know, you're going to deny me. And Peter, very brave, very blustery, said, no, I'm not, because he thought it was a good idea to disagree with Jesus. And very shortly right after that, Jesus was right, Peter was wrong, no surprise. And uh, Peter went out and wept, and the Bible says he wept bitterly. I think he realized how weak he was at that point, and it broke him. I just denied goodest, the goodest, the best, the most wonderful thing that this world has ever seen, the best man I've ever seen, God in flesh, I just denied him. But the encouragement we can take from Peter's life is that, listen, brothers and sisters, listen, Peter was not defined by his failure. Jesus came back to him, he restored him to faith, he said, I've got plans for you, and you are going to be a comfort to the other apostles. And today we know Peter as a great apostle. He was not defined by his failure. 
He's defined by his relationship to Jesus Christ and what God was able to accomplish through an open and willing person. Peter was a heroic, brave, courageous, strong man. And you know, the hard-headedness that it was his downfall, God says, God didn't say, get rid of that. God says, I can use that. And now you're going to be hard-headed for the truth. You're going to be hard-headed for love. You're going to be hard-headed for hope and peace and joy. You're going to be hard-headed for the things of God. You will be so hard-headed that you won't fear death. And so he took this messed up man, and made something beautiful and strong and powerful out of it. He was not defined by his failure. He was defined by what God was able to accomplish through a willing heart. Along with, with James and John, the two brothers, he forms this inner circle I was talking about, the three. So Jesus spent time with the 70, then he spent a more focused time on the 12, then he distilled that even further and spent a lot of time with the three passing his life on to them so that when he's gone, they could share it with others. Those two guys also, James and John, sons of thunder, they were also kind of rough around the edges. One time when a village rejected the message of Jesus Christ, you know what they did? They said, Jesus, let's call down fire out of the sky on this place. Just like, I'm thinking, they're probably thinking of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Let's just bring down fire out of the sky on this place. What is it with these guys that are rough around the edges and really have to learn that Jesus found so attractive? Well, they were tough men. They were guys who were going to go forward. And Jesus didn't make them into wimpy guys. He said, I'm going to take what you've got, but we're going to work on that, and you're going to be something better and more beautiful. And Jesus changed Peter, James, and John, this inner circle, uh, violent men, into men that would be bold for the kingdom. According to Tertullian and Origen, uh, two more early Christians along with Papias, you guys hear me quote from these guys all the time, uh, Peter died for his faith in Rome as an old man. And as an old man, when they were going to put him on a cross, he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Savior died. And they put him on upside down. So Peter died on an upside down cross. Uh, Andrew, like all the apostles, he was Jewish, right? The first Christians, the vast majority of them were all Jewish. Actually, it's been estimated that tens of thousands of the first Christians were all Jewish believers. Uh, Andrew, Peter's brother. The Adam Clark commentary, I like this. I like this because the gal who is playing the piano here is Rachel, my, my baby sister. And the, the, the guy right back there in the maroon shirt is my brother Paul. And my mom is teaching Sunday school, and dad, of course, is a co-pastor here with me at Foundation Bible Church. Listen to this. Andrew and Peter were brothers. There was two, possibly three sets of brothers in, this, in these 12 apostles. The Adam Clark commentary says, Happy are brothers who are joint envoys of heaven. And happy are the parents who have two or more children employed as ambassadors for God. It's a good thing. It's something to be proud of when a whole family is serving God. But then he says, But this is a very rare case, and family compacts and the work of the ministry are dangerous and should be avoided. Well, he may be onto something, and I just say, God, it's working so far. Please keep us from getting in the way of what you're doing, Lord. Uh, Lord God, please. Uh, Andrew was first a disciple of John the Baptist. Isn't that interesting? He was a disciple of John the Baptist when he meets Jesus Christ, and he knows this is the promised Messiah. And he, and he went, and he went to get his brother. Isn't that cool? You find Jesus, what do you do? You go get your family. Why would you keep this to yourself? Why would you? You get saved, you go tell your family. The interesting thing is he's instrumental. He brings Peter, the great apostle, to Jesus, and a lot of people don't, aren't really familiar with Andrew's name. The less famous guy brings the more famous guy, and that's another pattern that God does all the time. Somebody brings Billy Graham to faith. Somebody brings all these famous guys to faith. And the world forgets about them. But thank God that they were faithful, right? God's got this domino going through history of one person telling another, telling another, telling another. Another pattern that God uses. Andrew shared the message of Christ in what is now known as Turkey along the Black Sea and in Scythia and Thrace and kind of uh, over by Greece. And according to early Christian sources, he was killed for his faith in Greece. So starting a, a kind of a scary pattern here, aren't we? 
Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he might have been more literal than we'd like him to be. James, the son of Zebedee, and that's always going to be fun to say. His brother John, who is also the son of Zebedee, that's right. This is not the James who wrote the book of James in the New Testament. Isn't that confusing? Uh, that James was the brother of Jesus and the first leader of the Jerusalem church. Interestingly, even as Christianity grew, it became more and more Greek. It became more and more Gentile. But the church in Jerusalem survived the, the, during the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. They escaped to a different city. In, that was in 70 AD. They came back. And for about the first 100 years of Christianity until A.D. 130, because we have good records. Until about A.D. 130, all the pastors in Jerusalem were Jewish. Isn't that cool? And then about after the first 100 years, then it started to be Greek pastors of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, This James, not the James that I was just talking about, because, listen, if the Bible was a myth and a story, somebody just made it up, There'd be less Marys in there. There'd be less James in there. They'd, they'd be having a lot less of this people you have in the same name because that's just confusing. Uh, this James, along with his brother John, the sons of? Yeah, the sons of thunder. That's right, too. But they're the sons of Zebedee because their dad was Zebedee. Uh, were part of Christ's inner circle. But interestingly, he died only about a decade after Jesus Christ died and rose again and went back to heaven. I wouldn't have saw that coming. I said, the inner three, he's investing in them for long term. God does his thing. Who's going to say no to God? So he's got two of these guys, uh, Peter and John, who do live long. Both uh, Peter died probably in his 90s. John also in his 90s, maybe got close to 100. John wasn't killed for his faith. Peter was. But here, one of the other inner three dies just to 10 years after Jesus. Strange, strange. The book of Acts tells us that he was in prison because he had bold faith in King Herod. Now, if you're, if you're in prison because you stole something, lied or cheated or something, you can moan and complain about it and say, oh, I hate prison, I hate the system. You, you can do all that, but guess what? You deserve it. You're there for a reason. But who wants to be in prison when all you did was talk about Jesus Christ? He was in prison for being a good man. And guess what? A bad, nasty guy had power over him. And the bad, nasty guy, King Herod, had his head cut off. This is what the book of Acts tells us. Cut off with a sword. That doesn't seem fair. Okay, God, I'm in prison. You probably got me here so I can witness to the other prisoners, right? God, they're hauling me out of here. Are they letting me free? Why does that guy got a sword? You know, how is that fair? Well, the Bible doesn't explain it. The Bible just says this is what happened. He's part of the inner circle. He serves God for, for 10 years after Christ goes up and, uh, it, during the ascension. And then he suffers and dies. And he's the first apostle we have recorded in Scripture. The apostles are going to die for their faith. The vast majority of them. Some people think every one of them except for John. There's some, some of this uh, history, I'm gonna, sometimes I'll call it history because there's good witnesses to it. Sometimes I'm going to call it tradition because there's not such good witnesses or there's a separation of a few hundred years. Uh, so it, we're not certain that all the apostles other than John died for their faith, but a great many of them did. And God said, listen, follow me, and it might not go well with you on this earth. It might not on this earth. Later, Peter's in prison, and God doesn't always do the same thing. Just because God works one way with one church doesn't mean he's going to do the same thing with your church. Just because he, he does one thing with your friend, your friend prayed and they needed a car and they got a car, doesn't mean he's going to do the same thing. And so Peter is in jail. James was in jail. He dies. Peter's in jail. God sends an angel and miraculously frees him. Uh, Paul called James, Peter, and John the three pillars of the first Christian church. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. That James they called the pillar was the brother of Jesus, different James. Okay, Uh, the brother of John, by contrast, uh, his brother John, by contrast, lived to be a very old, not get killed for his faith. 
although he was exiled to an island for a time. Jesus entrusted his mother to John's care as he hung from the cross. I always think that's beautiful. God came. He died for our sins. There's the Roman Empire. There's the, there's the religious authorities. It's all going on. He's hammered. He's dying on a cross. He can hardly breathe. And he thinks to say, now this is the one that's not going to get martyred. I want you to take care of my mom. Because he knew John was going to be around a long time. So he's looking down with all the weight and responsibility of the world's sin on his shoulders. He's looking out for his mom. Uh, men, we have a lot to learn about looking out for our moms. Jesus entrusted his mother Mary again to John's care. John lived longer than any of the other apostles till about 100 A.D. And so we have several extra-biblical, not in the Bible, sources of people who met John and talked about him, and we still have their letters today. Isn't that cool? Uh, people like Polycarp, who were taught in person. Polycarp, Pastor Polycarp, learned from John in person. John wrote the Gospel of John, three short letters that are in the New Testament, and he wrote the book of Revelation. Paul called Jesus' brother James, that James, and then Peter, and then this John, not this John's brother James, the three pillars of the uh, early Christian church. Uh, next, Philip. Philip was friends with Andrew and Peter and Bartholomew. Uh, history tells us that like his friends Andrew and Peter, that he was killed on a cross for his faith in Jesus. Bartholomew, or possibly bar Telmai, meaning son of Telmai. So that could be Nathaniel or Nathaniel bar Telmai, Nathaniel the son of Telmai, uh, may have been known because his father was famous, but there's also another interesting possibility. His name's Nathaniel, could have been Nathaniel Bartholomew, but Bartholomew is, is also a nickname. And, and it means son of the furrows or plowboy. So I'm wondering if the other guys, a lot of them were fishermen, called that guy because he's got dirt underneath his fingers. He doesn't smell like fish. They, they called Nathaniel plowboy. So he's known in the scriptures and then plowboy. Uh, so I kind of wondered, it may be possible that, the, that these guys were calling him a nickname and it stuck. So Bart, Bart, he was kind of a salt of the earth kind of guy. He was, he was a very possibly a farmer. He was out in nature, just a basic, what you see is what you get. And Jesus said it. Jesus came to him and said, there's no deception in you. You're not uh, double-minded. You're not, you don't have a false face. What you see is what you get with the plowboy. And so uh, when Jesus tells him this, Bartholomew, because he's a basic guy, he's just adding two plus two equals four, oh, here's the Messiah. So he drops everything and he follows Jesus. He's simple. And, and Jesus likes that about him. He sees the truth and he goes after the truth. And he declares right on the spot, he says, this is the son of God and, and, and the king of Israel. He calls it like he sees it. He just saw it and he said it. Early tradition states that he was a great missionary, this plow boy. And God uses this farmer to travel all over the known world, bringing people to faith in Jesus. And finally, he, he dies for his faith according to history, in Armenia. Here's something interesting. He started a church in Armenia. Armenia has a distinction of being the very first nation in the, before, before the Roman Empire declared itself Christian. Armenia is the first Christian nation in the world to declare itself a Christian nation. And here's another cool thing. Armenia, in, the, in its kind of brother country, Georgia, right next to it, they're kind of over in the Middle East. If you look at their architecture and history, they're all European because they're always looking west to where Christianity was growing. So there's these two countries right in the north part of the Middle East that were always looking uh, towards Christianity, and they look like European countries that got taken out of Europe and put over north of the Middle East. Go ahead, go online, and Google them. You're going to be so surprised by the history of the architecture. Their knights look like European knights and not like uh, Muslim warriors. You know, it's just so bizarre that you had, and they was where, Long time, long before the United States, these are long time nations that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So every once in a while, say a prayer for Georgia, say a prayer for uh, Armenia. They're, uh, they've got it rough. Some, they've endured a lot of persecution at the hands of Russia, and over the years, a lot of persecution from the Muslim armies around them. So say a prayer for Georgia and Armenia. All right, moving on. Uh, Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas, which... Uh, by the way, he's also going to die for his faith. He was a guy that kind of history defined by his, by his failure, which is not fair. 
uh, even after the apostles. The other apostles are, are excited and they're talking about Jesus Christ as resurrected. And he said, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe it till I see him myself and I'll put my finger in the nail's hands. And then I'm going to, with that spear stuck up inside, I'm going to take my hand and put it right in his rib cage. Because he said, I'm not going to believe it. Even if I see it, I'm not going to believe it. I'm going to have to touch him. When the resurrected Jesus Christ appears before him, he just falls down. He falls down, he worships, and he says, my Lord and my God. Doubting Thomas stopped doubting at that point. Twenty years later, Thomas finds himself in India. Isn't that cool? Doubting Thomas is now a bold missionary. He left his comfort zone. He left his people group. And there was some thriving Jewish populations in India. And we know this from Indian history, too, that uh, uh, some of the local, the chieftains, they would hire Jewish mercenaries because their Jews were such great warriors, and they wouldn't go to war on Saturday because their Jewish mercenaries wouldn't fight on Sabbath. And we know this from, from uh, in, uh, the history of India, so that's really cool. So Thomas goes over there because there's these Jewish populations in India, and he's winning souls, he's baptizing people to faith in Jesus Christ, and he does it for about 20 years in India. And at that point, some Hindu priests get ticked off that he's leading all these people to Jesus. Uh, he tries to run, but he's not young. He gets out of town, he gets up on a hill, he knows he's not going to escape, so he just bends over and starts praying, and he's run through with a spear. And there was a, the moment his heart stopped, his brainwave ceased, there was a celebration in heaven because another mighty man of God stepped into eternity. And there is no safer place to be than in the center of God's will. Matthew, the tax collector, he wrote the book. We just read chapter 10. When, when he met Jesus, he also... He meets Jesus, and what does he do? He opens up his home, he throws a party, and he invites all of his friends over. A lot of us in the Bible says there were prostitutes and, and other wicked uh, tax collectors who had been cheating the people. He opens up his home, he meets Jesus, and right away he says, you got to meet this guy. You guys got to meet this guy. This is a great pattern we're seeing again and again and again. And he changed his ways completely. He's another man who changed. He wasn't the same. He no longer wanted to cheat anybody. And he told Jesus, I'm going to make it up to anybody that I have wronged. James, the son of Elpheus, again, possibly Matthew's brother, and thus probably he would also be well-educated like Matthew. Matthew, like some of these guys I said, maybe didn't have a good education. Matthew probably spoke several languages, had an excellent education because he was working for the Roman government. Uh, not much is known about this James, uh, an apostle, most people would say that's being a big deal. But apparently, he didn't cry the spotlight. He didn't he need to insert himself everywhere. He was an apostle, but history doesn't know a lot about him. I kind of like that. Thaddeus, or Jude, and I, I always can't think of the apostle Jude without hearing my grandpa Wilbur, who was a pastor as well, call my mom St. Jude all the time, St. Jude. So Thaddeus is the name, uh, it's the same name as Judas, by the way. So you have Judas Iscariot, who betrays Jesus, and so you have Jude. And it's the same name. Uh, in English, it can come out two different ways. The writers of the Gospels probably didn't want to confuse the two. Like Plowboy, remember Bartholomew? Possibly Plowboy is his nickname. Thaddeus is another nickname. Thaddeus means courageous of heart. Now, that could be his real name was Thaddeus or Jude, but that could also have been his moniker. This boy, courageous of heart. Legend says that he was killed by an axe for his bold faith. But uh, again, that's uncertain as far as the historical references for that. Simon the Zealot or Simon the Zealous. I, I always thought that, and I was going to spend some time talking about how this guy was possibly an assassin. And uh, the Zealots were these, were these uh, far right-wing uh, political guys, and they wanted to run the Roman Empire out. Uh, and Jesus was telling him not to fight with swords. And I was going to share how this zealot put down his sword and learned to follow it. But then scholars are saying that maybe zealot isn't the right way, and the party of the zealots didn't start till about 30 years after this time. So I don't know. He's either a precursor, a part of that radical political group, or he was just very zealous. He was known as his passion for the things of God. Either way, uh, you don't come in close with Jesus without change and being transformed, and we know that as an apostle, he wasn't going to change the world with a gun or a sword. 
He was going to change the world by the power of Jesus Christ. Tradition says that he was sawed in half for his faith. You, you're going to want to go with a sword, you know. You don't want to be sawed in half. That takes too long. Uh, and then there's Judas Iscariot, and he was a scary, scary guy. Uh, the guy who was so low that while he was treasurer, uh, he was stealing from the group's funds. And when he betrays Jesus, he leads a mob out to Jesus in the middle of the night, and he leans over and he gives Jesus a kiss on the cheek to identify him. And then when he sees what's going on, he freaks out. He goes back to the temple to the priests that had paid him to betray Jesus. He takes the money, he just throws it at him, and then he goes out and kills himself. But what he never did was repent. He never, he never accepted the forgiveness of God. He goes out and kills himself. This is sad. Even somebody who is part of Christ's inner group could turn and leave Christ behind. These are the men that Jesus called. Again, none of them are the cream of the crop. If they were, they would have been, if they were, they would have been religious leaders in Israel at that time. They're just an odd mix of really, really different kinds of people. You would not have found these guys hanging out together. Like some of them were brothers, some were friends. But this group, and I want you to look around today, that's the way the church is supposed to be. We don't go to church so we can hang out with people just like ourselves. God brings different kinds of people together for a reason so that we can glorify him. In God's family in heaven, guess what? There's going to be a lot of different kinds of people up there. And if people that you're uncomfortable with down here today, you better start learning to love them because you may end up being stuck with them in eternity. Heaven is going to be very diverse. The apostles were in a diverse group, and we today are an extraordinarily diverse group of people in the church, and that is a beautiful thing. That's something to rejoice in and to relish. An odd, odd mix. Uh, I, heard, uh, I heard a man once say that the thing he loves about uh, Christianity is that uh, you can see a day laborer pushing the broom in church one week and a millionaire pushing the broom next week because everybody serves in the church. Everybody is in. And guess what? That's the same way. That's somebody in our generation described the church that way. In the very beginning, the early church, the Romans said, you have slaves sitting next to a wealthy man on, on, uh, in their services, worship services. The church, still known as a place where different kinds of people brought together, not because we're all Packer fans, although I wish we were. Uh, <laughs> different kinds of people brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ. He died for me. I'm messed up, and I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven. And he died for you, and you're saved. And, and you put your faith in him, we're going to heaven. And we are one family. One family. So how about it? Have you come to faith in Jesus Christ? Have you let the blood of Christ cover your sins? Now I want to ask you another question. Why are you here today? Why did you come to church together today? And there's two ways we can answer that. How did it come to pass that on this particular Sunday in July, you found yourself at church. Well, I'll tell you how it started. Jesus called 12 guys. Jesus called 12 guys, and they told their story to others. And you know what? Those people didn't keep it to themselves. They told it to others, who told it to others, who told it to others, so on and so on, until hundreds of years and thousands of years later, we are organically connected to Jesus Christ himself. Because we heard the message from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody, going all the way back to the first 12 apostles who heard it from Jesus Christ himself. And there's a continuous living line from Christ himself. Christ, God, sent. That's what apostle means. It means sent one. God sent the apostles, and that's why you are here this morning. Isn't that cool? The story didn't close. It was another chapter, and every generation is another page. That's why we're here today. But there's another way to answer that question. Why are you here today? In the sense of, what's the reason you're here? What's the purpose? Or better yet, what's God's purpose for having you here today? What is God's purpose for you being here today? And the answer is, so that you can be a sent one. So that you can be a sent one. So that you will take the message of Christ his life, his death for our sins, his victory over death that he won when he got up out of that grave, you're here today. 
Just like, te- uh, just like Jesus was teaching the apostles, God is teaching us this morning that we should be sent ones. We're here today because the sent ones that have gone on before us shared the message of Jesus Christ generation after generation, family member to family member, friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, coworker to coworker, until you heard that message yourself, you heard it, you repented, you believed, and guess what? Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Are you going to be a disciple, learning to humble ourselves and believe and obey everything we hear? Are we going to learn and obey and follow God's will for our lives? And when we hear that call, are we going to answer it? And, and are we going to hoard the message of eternal life and keep it to ourselves or maybe just our family? No, it's our turn to take the message out, just like the apostles 2,000 years ago. It's our turn to make a difference, our turn to do something worthwhile with our lives. It's our turn to save the world. And this is what Jesus Christ set in motion. It was a good plan. And God's going to glorify himself through 12 regular Joes, and God's going to glorify himself through people like you and me. We don't have to be the best. We don't have to be the elite. All we have to be is willing servants to say, God has saved me. God loves me, and I know he loves you too. And we get sent out by God, and we teach others so that they in turn can teach more and more and more. And that's how we're going to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the example of the apostles, their boldness of faith, their love. Lord God, help me not to be too cynical for your beauty, your truths. And help me not to complicate things. I don't want to get in the way of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Just help us, Father, to listen, humble ourselves, obey, and then go out and love people the way your son Jesus Christ did. Help us to love people enough to share the cross. Help us to love people enough that we're willing to go out there, Lord. Call them to repent. Call them to obedience. And teach them, Lord, how then they too can go out and win more and more people. Father, help us to be an effective church. Help us to be a loving church. Help us to be a church that you don't want to spew out of your mouth because we're lukewarm. But Father, I pray that you'd look down from heaven and be pleased. In any area where we're not pleasing to you, Father, please just get our attention, Father, and, uh, and help us, Lord, to respond and uh, work in us and through us, Lord. This is what we ask. This is what we desire. This is what we want more than anything, that you would work in and through our lives, Father. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.